Any child after the trauma of divorce probably needs some counsel, yeah. but try and find counsel that fits within the context of safety that that child is made to experience in, in their environment. Thank you for joining us for the Blended Kingdom Families podcast. This podcast is for blended families, the people who love them, and anyone who just wants to improve their marriage and family relationships. BKF exists to break the cycle of divorce, equip marriages, and unite blended families with the truth of God's word. It is our hope that today you will receive biblical guidance and practical resources that will bring unity and peace to create your thriving, healthy home. Let's jump in. Hey guys, welcome to the Blended Kingdom Families podcast. We are so excited you're here with us and we have somebody just absolutely tremendous with us, Lauren Reitzema. Did I say that correctly? Close, right, Sima. Yes, right, Sima. I knew I was gonna do that. It's okay. <laughs> All Lauren, well. it's great to have you with us, and we are so blessed and excited uh, for you to be here and share uh, some great words of wisdom with our audience. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. Awesome. Well, you guys, I just want to share with you a little bit about our guest, Lauren. Lauren's interest in relationship skills began when her parents divorced after almost 20 years of marriage. Um, she wanted to seek to understand bettered patterns of her own future legacy, and she earned a bachelor in communications from TCU. Lauren also is the author of In Their Shoes, which is this amazing resource and book, you guys, that we're going to be talking about. It's a book dedicated to helping parents better understand, understand and connect with children of divorce. Her second book, titled Relationship Essentials, is scheduled also to be released this coming November. So yay mm -hmm. for that, Lauren. Um, Lauren's vocational speaking experience spans over 15 years, teaching a variety of relationship skills to youth, adults, and corporate teams. She and her husband, Josh, love adventures with their three children. They all live in Colorado, and they are avid skiers, outdoor enthusiasts, and Broncos fans. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it is great to have you, and we've so enjoyed getting to know you, and, and I love the heart for this book. Um, I love that you are passionate about connecting mm -hmm. um, parents and kids at post-divorce, uh, and we're going to dive into it and get more in, involved with the content here. But before we do, beyond the introduction, Lauren, we'd love for you to tell our listeners a little bit more about you, your passion, how you... Know, you got into this and doing all that you do? Sure. I am a, quite a, a passionate person. I, I have an Italian background, so I've been told to be fiery, but I hope I direct that passion toward help, helpful things. And uh, sometimes it's in conflict, so we'll talk about <laughs> that. But I was uh, really inspired to take pen to paper for this book, actually after a speaking engagement where I had spoken about my experience firsthand from a, as a child of divorce and many of the people that I was speaking to lined up to talk to me afterwards with, mm. with these just big eyes and, and hungry, hungry souls. I would actually say souls because it was as if they had heard something brand new that they'd been longing to hear from their child's perspective. Because I think if there's one theme in my own family's legacy and history with rebuilding and reblending after divorce is that it is a process that can often last a lot longer than you had anticipated. And there are surprises along the way. And oftentimes uh, the most troubling thing for the adults that I work with or talk to is how deeply uh, grieved they are that their children are suffering. And I just desire to bring hope not only to uh, bio and step parents uh, from my story, but also to, this, to the kids that we are serving and looking at to be able to say, hey, here I am 20 plus years after my parents split. And uh, it's not, not all downhill from here, but there are some hurdles and hiccups that maybe I could speak into and, and offer some encouragement. So the hope is really just to connect through real life and and also to bring light to a subject that I think is uh, oftentimes hidden in the cracks of the yeah. church and in the cracks of just even relationships because uh, divorce is, is truly sometimes a necessary step to get out of a toxic relationship, but the impacts are often minimized um, and sometimes not discussed as, as much as I believe that children need to process. So that's really the heart is to just tell a story and hope that in telling my story, 
uh, other stories can feel like they're not alone. I, I want to ask a question, mm -hmm. and and this is just something that kind of occurred to me as you were speaking. I know a lot of parents, you know, really, you know, after their divorce and they're, and they're moving through their own transitions. I, my curiosity is, how do you know if you're disconnected from your mm -hmm. children? How do you know that there is a connection problem? Mm, that's good. It's a little bit more mysterious if you're dealing with teenagers, <laughs> because yeah. I think there's a, there's a mystery in that life stage as a whole. And it's very natural and normative in mm. kind of that child psychology to cling more to your friends and your peers than to your family. And if you throw a divorce narrative in there and some new relationships and some insecurities, uh, the disconnect can manifest a lot faster or in, in more, uh, I guess, more felt and in, in, in impactful ways. However, I think the disconnect can sometimes be what the signs are because a lot of, a lot of uh, kids deal with being connected with their parents in a different manner anyway. Some are more introverted naturally. And so divorce or no divorce, they're, they're just going to be more isolated in their room. But I think yeah. Uh, the way I would say is looking at incremental presence rather than these monumental mentor conversations that are tearjerkers and, you know, end with a hug and is just the, the incremental disciplines and habits to stay present and to stay postured and to stay patient. Because I think that there is, there's no telltale sign that I know in, in my field, but I do know that uh, withdrawal and depression and mm -hmm. um, some anxiety, some hyper performance are some signs of grief in general that you can look for. I don't think there's a one sign tells all, but I do think just that stonewalling or shut, shutting down completely is an important thing to, to note, but also um, to give space for yeah. that process, because I think the the opposite effect can happen if you're trying to connect and you you go too close too fast or you actually discourage the child's timeline and they can they can end up withdrawing even more in, in that yeah. case. That's yeah. good. No, that's so good, Lauren. Um, Lauren, can we, I wanna dive into the book and I know um, you have on the book, it says helping pet parents better understand and connect with children of divorce. So on a practical and spiritual level, how can parents who, you know, anyone who's listening right now that's maybe in this season right now and they're having difficulty with this, what is some advice and encouragement that you would give them in this area? The first thing I would say, you cannot do this alone in your good. bio or blended family. First of all, because of your emotions in the aftermath of divorce as an adult, it's not easy to take care of yourself and have the extra margin to take care of a lot of uh, really, really tender emotions from your children, but it is not your children or, or child's role to take care of you. And so therefore you need to find your people. You need to find uh, a sports coach, a, a family member, a teammate, uh, a neighbor, somebody in your church community or in your school community who you can be candid with about what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of pride in announcing the divorce uh, or the post-divorce narrative because there's so much, there's a split sometimes in the church, there's a split in the home, there's a split in the family. And therefore that shame that you can sometimes cover up tends to isolate you from community. Mm -hmm. And kids and adults desperately need community who are healthy and whole, whole in their emotional process so that you have the margin you need to heal and don't depend on your, your child to be the one to bring you up out of that. That is actually called parentification and it can have some detrimental effects on the stress that children carry and oftentimes ends up making them mask their emotions as they're trying to tend to you. So find your people, be brave and bold, find someone trustworthy that you can be pretty authentic with and allow them to know the boundaries that you're willing to take, but have other adults mm -hmm. and even peers that can speak into your child's life. No, it's good. And, and I know there are people who are watching that, you know, in our ministry, we get a lot of people who really tune in because they are in fire seasons. Mm -hmm. They are going through wilderness seasons where they're really struggling and looking for resources. Mm -hmm. And 
I know as a counselor, that premise that you, it's really difficult to help other people unless you're healed yourself. It, mm -hmm. it makes it really challenging. And so I just want to encourage anybody who's listening that may be in that season and, and not connected with their children, right. you know, great advice. And also I would just add, you know, finding a counselor, mm -hmm. finding somebody who you can talk with and go through a grieving healing process mm -hmm. um, is so important to that overall family dynamic and family wellness. Yeah. The other thing I would say is I know a lot of parents who are trying to connect with their children. Mm. And, and I echo what you talked about, about the teenage years. Yeah. That's a strange time that I'm not really sure what's going on, if they're, if they're great, if they're not, if they're in their room. So I, I, I feel, and we definitely experience that on a daily basis, raising a teenager. But I do know a lot of parents are trying to connect uh, and they're not being successful. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, is there a point in time when you feel like the warning signs are great enough that you would seek outside help? Uh, that maybe you can't do this on your own and that you need some additional help. What, w what would a parent look for? I think uh, si signs of withdrawal are, I would say, the extremes. Anything that's extreme on either the, I think what sometimes gets overlooked is that hyper performance uh, grief and the anxiety. I think that was more of my story, whereas some of my siblings may have gone with more of the withdrawal or the mm. shutdown kind of mentality. I was was so committed to not letting anyone see my cracks or making sure that I did not uh, become a statistic of divorce. I really, really pressed in to prove it, that, I, that my grades could stay up, that I could still accomplish all of my goals in athletics and the things that I was involved in. And I, from the outside, looked completely healthy and probably more than okay. And on the inside, I was crum crumbling and carrying a lot of heavy burdens and, and just loneliness that I was masking what was really happening mm -hmm. in my process. So I was the kid who ran toward counsel and said, I need help and I, I want a counselor, but I had to be postured and ready to receive that. Uh, I have seen parents that look at you know just one word answers or sh shut shut down in their room or they they don't answer when you knock on their door and immediately send their child to therapy and they mm. they actually aren't quite ready for for that at that moment and so i would say uh allowing the voice of the child to be a part of it and maybe even reconsidering what counseling and therapy actually looks like i think reframing that mm -hmm. um Maybe you find a counselor who's willing to meet with your student at a coffee shop or, uh, you know, on a Zoom call that's not a counseling appointment. Because I think the most terrifying uh, and frustrating thing that I remember was that first door that I opened in this stale, you know, office building that ha had all the suites and the where where the different physicians were. And I, you know, you're sitting on this couch and you almost feel this burden of. I'm not safe here and I don't know any of these people. And, and so find a platform and a, a context where that extra help may feel safer. And you may even be able to not decept, not, not with deception, but, you know, slip it in, in a way that is more organic and natural in that community. And, uh, I think every faith community that I know has some lay counselors, some professional counselors. So, so maybe just find that resource so that, it can start with not a man, we need counsel right now because these signs are telling us, but any child after the trauma of divorce probably needs some counsel. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. rather than creating a, a waiting game until you see something, I would say seek counsel no matter what the grief cycle looks yeah. like, but try and find counsel that fits within the context of safety that that child is made to experience in, in their environment you know, throw a lacrosse ball back and forth or yeah. kick a soccer ball in the field and just start the conversation with open-ended communication. And uh, I, th I think you'll you'll find some progress. Yeah. No, and I love that you said that, Lauren, about going to therapy and getting a hold of that after divorce versus later down the road when you're seeing um, the effects exacerbated yeah. or, you know, manifesting more in, in those situations. And so kind of hitting it head on because 
A divorce is traumatic, and it's traumatic for the children. Yeah. They, you know, their whole ecosystem has just been flipped upside down, and um, hitting it, um, you know, head on, yeah. and getting help. Whether that's like you were saying, mentoring or pastoral counseling from the church, or maybe just some coaching, you know, um, you yeah. know how, however you want to word it. But well, and you probably know what I'm going to say next. I yeah. love what you said about counseling environments. Mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> such a proponent of thinking outside of everything that's been done before yeah. because I, as a counselor, don't like those environments. I think they're very limiting, especially to children, because yeah. it's intimidating. It is intimidating. It's very intimidating. You don't, they don't want to be there. It's stuffy and it's, and I think that not enough people look at, look at counseling and ask that mm -hmm. question. Can we bring this environment somewhere else? Can we go and mm -hmm. can I just, can you meet him and have a walk? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think parents, if don't be scared of that process and don't be scared to ask that question mm -hmm. because we do have to meet the next generation sometimes where they are yeah. and not where we want them to be. So yeah. uh, bravo for talking about that. I would talk about no. that all day long. That's awesome. Um, so I know that we work with blended families and this is our ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and your book is absolutely dead on relevant to what our audience needs to hear. Mm -hmm. But what would what encouragement or advice would you give a blended family if they were sitting right in front of you? What encouragement would you give them? The first thing I would say is that the oh man, say the long haul. I I think the the long view is the is required to be encouraged, but I think really, really hard in the moments. Uh, I have found myself sharing that long view hope as an encouragement and hitting a conversation where people say, I know I get it, but I need something right now. This is so hard. I've never felt so invisible. I've never felt so unappreciated. I've never felt so alone. And I, I really think um, something that I hate to say because I don't want it to be true, but I think needs to be said because it really is true, is that in certain situations, your expectations for health or hope mm -hmm. have to be shortened, have to be lowered, have to be more coming from more of a realism perspective. Otherwise you're shattered every single day. And so I would say to take your dreams and your hopes to a God who can reconcile the most uh, difficult and challenging circumstances, but to really look for those threads. And I mean, those threads where you can call them a victory and write them down and close the door and do a little happy dance to yourself and, and try and collect those deposits as they come. Because if you try and embrace the picture of your five, 10, 15, or even 20 year plan, you might not make it. <laughs> and so I would just really encourage you to recognize that sometimes there are expectations that you can't change. And even the most hope to, hopeful optimist needs to surrender some of those in order to survive. And one of those has to do with your worth and your value and your integrity. Um, I'm going to speak specifically to step moms in this particular case, not because I'm, I'm stereotyping based on your biological sex, but rather because I have seen a lot more uh, pushback and, and, and tears in the women that are trying so hard to find a voice in these lives and changing the diapers and packing the lunches and going to the soccer games or prom dress shopping and they still feel invisible. Mm. And I know that that's not fair, but it's really not about you. There's a whole chapter in my book that explores the why behind that. And it has a lot to do with the child's grieving process and not with how you show up. And so mm. I just would stay, would stay there and continue to look at the long view, but take joy from those micro victories so that you don't wear out. No, oh, that's good. That's good. Even as a stepdad, I, I, I receive that, that encouragement and I receive that, um, that book of knowledge. It's mm -hmm. good stuff. Yes. 
Well, Lauren, the last question that we have, and it, the name of our ministry is Blended Kingdom Families. And we ask this to all of our guests, but what is a blended kingdom family to you? It's part of the process that Jesus has every kingdom person on in order to understand the purpose for the cross and for the resurrection. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I believe that it is removing the shame from your story while still being bold enough to claim and own the brokenness of our, our flesh and, and our, the, you know, the sin that we are born into mm -hmm. and, and to take ownership with that, uh, fully and completely so that as you heal and as you reconcile, you, you, redeem the next generation and not just your family. I think really being kingdom minded to me is looking at the eternal. Yeah. And I think part of that is changing a course forever rather than kind of covering up your course mm -hmm. so that you, you can survive. I think there's a, there's a desperate need to change the direction of the next generation instead of to just heal and, and, um, and kind of close out the story of, of grace that you've needed in that moment. Yeah. That's good. That's good stuff. It's good yeah. stuff. We have just, just loved having you here, Lauren, and just yes. appreciate your, your heart for ministering and your heart for equipping parents with amazing resources. Mm -hmm. Um, could you tell everybody how they can find you, all of our listeners, how they can track you down? Certainly. I, I like being pursued. <laughs> no, I, uh, you can find me at, I have two social platforms, one on Instagram and one on Facebook. I have an author profile on Facebook at Lauren Reitzema. That's R E I T is in Tom S E M is in mom a, mm -hmm. and I also, I am in the middle of merging actually an in Instagram, but you can find me at, uh, L O J O R E I T S Lojo writes, uh, it's a combination of my husband and my, and then our last name, uh, that would be our Instagram profile. And then I am always open to correspond via email as well. And that is just my first name, Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, at myrelationshipcenter.org. And I look forward to connecting uh, to those of you guys who have further questions. Awesome. 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 Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us today and just sharing about your book. And you guys, again, if you're watching or listening in their shoes, um, it's an amazing resource that Lauren um, has developed for parents, you know, being able to better understand um, and connect with children of divorce. So get this resource um, if you're in that season and you need some help. So again, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us again today. It's been such a blessing. You're very welcome. Pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you haven't already, please take an opportunity to leave us a review on our Apple podcast. We would so love to hear from you. Yes, you guys. Thank you again and be blessed in all you do today. Take care. Hey guys, so glad you were here with us today and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And you can find more resources from Blended Kingdom Families at blendedkingdomfamilies.com. Join us again next time as we hang out with more amazing podcast guests. And remember, nothing will be impossible with God.